Hi, I'm Derek Heidemann, and I'm the Director of Collections and Research here at Old Serpent Village. We're standing here in our collection storage facility today where we hold most of our over 40,000 objects that are held in the museum's collection. Now, the Old Serpent Village collection really encompasses a broad variety of objects um, that generally all relate to the period from 1790 to 1840 in rural New England. So that encompasses everything from paintings to baskets to stoves, all sorts of everyday objects. And a large portion of that collection is the textile collection. Um, now the textile collection, of course, is gonna be everything from quilts and blankets to socks and shirts and shifts, but also gowns, coats, all sorts of clothing, um, everything from little kids' clothing up to adult clothing. So, one thing that's really great about specifically the textile collection, but the, the collection more generally here at the museum, is because it does relate to everyday life, it's much easier for us nowadays in 2021 to make a very strong link to the early 19th century and the people that, that lived in it that we're talking about here at the museum. So when you're looking at a garment like this gown here, this tailcoat, you can see you know, the size of the person, how they were built, um, you know, how they might have taken care of their clothing and altered it over time. In some cases, although these are in really, really good shape for their age, we do have some objects that are heavily mended and repaired, but even that is really meaningful because you can actually see how that person you know, wore the clothing. Um, so they, they provide these really, really strong links to the real human element of the past. So it's not just a stove or an andiron or a basket. There are these actual pieces that people wore in their everyday lives. So it's just a really meaningful connection to the past. Uh, so what we're gonna be talking about today in this video are a couple of different things relating to objects from the museum's textile collection. So we're gonna start out uh, with Rachel Hollenbeck, who's gonna be talking about yarn sewn mittens and she'll be taking you through everything from the processing of the raw fleece to the finished mitten. Then she'll be going to or transitioning to Rebecca Bell who will be talking about clothing that has been repurposed, refashioned, reused in various ways, let out to expand with the person as they grew older. Uh, and then we're going to end it with Sarah Ramsey who will be talking about bonnets and kind of in a similar vein she'll be talking about how those might have been changed or updated over time to keep up with the latest fashions. So this video is made uh, possible by the sponsorship through the Bridge Street Foundation, part of Mass Humanities. So we just want to thank them and we hope you enjoy the video. Here are some yarn sewn mittens from our old Sturbridge Village collection. The yarn sewn mittens are knit mittens that have loops sewn over the entire mitten. Those serve several purposes. It covers up any stains or holes in the original mittens and makes them look like new again, but it also makes it double the thickness, so really nice and warm for winter time. These mittens have some flowers, some diamonds, very fashionable for the time. We also have a pair of mittens in our collection that have polka dots on them and some stripes. And another pair of mittens that we have in our collection, smaller pair, has a different kind of flower. Each of these mittens show a fashionable way of reusing some mittens that have been worn out. To do this, wool processing is required. We start the wool processing by shearing the sheep. When we shear the sheep, we start in the middle and it acts like we're taking off a winter coat. Do one side, the other side, and the back with the goal of keeping the fleece all in one piece. From there, we sort it. The wool that's on the stomach area is rougher, more coarse hair and wool. So that is what we use for rugs and other items that aren't touching the skin directly. The sides of the sheep are where the soft wool is. So that's good for hats, mittens, scarves, stockings, muffetees, which are fingerless gloves, tippets, which are house capes. All of those things are for, you need soft wool for because they are touching the skin. Once we have sorted the wool, then we start the picking process. With the picking process, we are taking the pieces of the wool and pulling apart all the fibers so that when we scour it, all the fibers will be clean. When we first receive the wool after it's been sheared from the sheep, the fibers are sticking together. They're really greasy. That is because the sheep secrete an oil, which is very good for them because it goes to the ends of the wool and covers the sheep, which keeps them warm and dry when it's a rainy or snowy day. It's not so good for us when we're wool processing, so we pull apart all those pieces for the scouring process. If we just put the wool um, from the sheep 
into the scouring solution. Then we would have pieces that are clean on the outside, but all clumped together and still oily on the inside, wet and greasy. The next step in the process is scouring. Scouring is cleaning out the grease from the wool. As we scour, we start a fire in our fire pit, hang kettles, put water in the kettles, and then add our scouring solution. In the 1830s, the scouring solution was SIG, or chamber lye. Chamber lye is the liquid contents of your family's chamber pots, poured into a barrel in the kitchen, and fermented for two to three weeks. After adding the chamber lye, then we put the picked wool in on top. The wool falls into the water, and the oil is melted off. As the oil rises to the top, the debris falls to the bottom, and the wool is clean. Once the wool is clean, we spread it on a clean sheet and let it dry in the sun. The next step in wool processing, now that the wool is clean, is brushing out the tangles. Here are some wire bristle brushes, otherwise known as hand cards. Hand cards are what are used to take out the tangles, move all the fibers in the same direction, and also remove any small pieces of debris like dried grass or sticks that are still left in the wool. When it's time to card, we take the wool and brush it across the wire bristle brushes. It catches on the bristles, and then we take the other hand card and brush out the tangles. Periodically, we switch hands, move all the wool to the other brush, and then brush it again. We continue this process until all the tangles are removed. Another option for taking out the tangles is to take your wool to a carding mill. For a small fee, you could have your wool carded in a fraction of the time that it would take to hand card it. The next step in the process is spinning the wool into yarn. <laughs> we take our carded wool and attach it to yarn that's already on the spinning wheel. I pull on the piece of wool that's connected to the wheel and pull it out until it's arm length. And then I turn the wheel and as the wheel is turned, the spindle turns as well. As the spindle turns, the yarn falls off the end and puts a twist up the entire piece. Once we fill up the spindle on the spinning wheel, then we take the yarn off and we wrap it around a nitty knotty. Nitty knotties are one of my favorite tools because they serve several important purposes. When we take the yarn off of the spinning wheel, it will untwist if we just let it loose. So instead, we wrap it around the nitty knotty, and every time we go all the way around, we have two yards. It measures it for us, but it also sets the twist. When we wrap it around, we wrap it somewhat tightly, and we leave it for at least 12 to 24 hours. When we leave it on the nitty knotty, it keeps that twist, and it gives the wool a new memory. Once we have left the wool for at least 12 to 24 hours, we can leave it for longer if we'd like. Then we take it off, just pull it off the end, and we have a skein of yarn. The skein is typically balled up, and then we ply it. To ply the yarn, we ball up two, three, or four separate pieces of yarn and put them in pots at the base of the wheel. Then we spin all of the pieces of yarn together, making a thicker yarn that's warmer, it lasts longer, we won't get holes in our stockings so quickly, and it also means that it's easier to knit with. Once we've spun the yarn, then we will dye it into different colors. To dye the yarn, we use our fire pit outside and we hang kettles over the top of the fire pit. We usually have three kettles filled with water. The first kettle just has warm water for heating up and cooling down the yarn. The second kettle has a mordant in it. Usually that's alum and cream of tartar and that opens up the fibers of the yarn to absorb as much color as possible. And then our third kettle is our dye stuffs. Sometimes we can put the mordant and the dye stuffs together depending on the receipt or recipe. Usually we soak our dye stuffs for several days, sometimes up to a week beforehand, and then boil it the morning that we are going to dye. We put the yarn into the dye bath and let it soak for an hour to an hour and a half to absorb as much color as possible. Usually every 10 to 15 minutes we pull out the yarn and turn it inside out so that all the fibers are an equal color and the outside isn't darker than the inside. Then when the hour and a half is done, we pull out the yarn, we rinse it several times in water um, to take out that extra dye so that if we don't knit it and then have all the extra dye stuff soak into our clothing when it rains. And then 
After we've rinsed the yarn, then we let it dry. Once the yarn is fully dry, then it's time to make some projects. Sometimes we'll make something new and knit new mittens, hats, stockings. Sometimes we actually use the yarn to make something old new again. Processing wool takes a lot of time and work, so we try to use our knitted items for as long as we can. Sometimes that means fixing holes in the items, sometimes that means cutting off thumbs or the tops of the mittens and re-knitting them, and sometimes that means yarn sewing over the entire mitten so we can use the original mitten for longer. It took a lot of time and energy for folks in the 19th century to make and maintain their clothes. And reading through 19th century diaries, it's really amazing how many days had at least some of the day devoted to maintaining the textiles for the family, whether it be making the clothing, uh, ironing, laundry, and then ultimately mending and repairing the clothing to make it last as long as possible. And when you think about the time that it took to make the clothing and the materials used, it really made sense to try and care for your clothing and make it last as long as possible to save not only your money, but also your time as you don't have to make an entirely new garment every time it gets a hole in it. Today, we tend to throw things away socks and jeans and t-shirts as soon as it has a hole, but folks in the 19th century were much more conscious of repairing their clothing and making it last for a little bit longer. And I brought some things out from our collection that demonstrate just that. So my favorite to start with is darning, and it's a little bit of a lost skill. Basically darning is taking a needle and thread and weaving threads over a hole to patch it and mend it. And sometimes it can be done so carefully that you really don't see the darn unless you're very close to the garment. And other times, especially with stockings, it can be a little bit thicker and a little bit more noticeable. The darning, especially on stockings, tends to be typically on the heel and the toe, uh, the two places of the stocking that are worn the most. And at a certain point after the heel and the toe have been darned and darned again, it starts to get a little bit uncomfortable. And at that point, rather than throwing out the stockings, you would go one step further and do a little domestic surgery and literally cut the whole toe or the whole heel off of your stocking, very carefully pick up the stitches on your knitting needles and knit on a whole fresh toe or fresh heel, as is the case right here. So it seems like a lot of work, but when you think about the amount of labor it took to make that entire pair of stocking, either a pair of half hose that go up to your knee or a pair of full hose that go all the way up your leg, it seems a little bit more reasonable that you're going to try and take every step to make sure you don't have to knit an entirely new pair of stockings every time you get a hole. What I love about some of our stockings in the collection too is they show this process either being on the needles or with a very distinct color change in the foot. So you can see very clearly that this material is a little bit different from the material used in the foot of the stocking. And sometimes the gauge of the stitches even changes a little bit as well. So the stockings in our collection have clearly gone through multiple periods of repair and mending. Another technique that folks are using to maintain their clothing is patching and mending. And it would be pretty common for ladies in the 19th century to have a little bag or a basket full of scraps that could be pulled into use for mending and maintaining the clothing. The places that tend to get patched most often, of course, work clothes tend to require uh, upkeep a little bit more than the fancier clothes, though you certainly do see some patching on the fancy clothes. And places like knees and elbows and all of the usual suspects where we usually uh, find ourselves getting holes as well, particularly on children's garments. So this sweet little gown has had a patch on the elbow and she's used not quite the same but a very similar blue check material to neatly patch that. And this little boy skeleton suit worn by Tristan Little, who uh, in 1815 was about two years old and lived in New Hampshire. And you can see that it has two very big patches on the knees and a little patch right on the seat of his trousers. So by doing neat patchwork, you would be able to extend the life cycle of these clothes a little bit longer. And especially with children's clothes, they're being passed down, perhaps from one sibling to the next or one generation to the next. So keeping them in good order is really, really helpful. Folks are not just patching, but also altering their clothes as well. And in some cases, doing it very discreetly so that when you look at the clothing from the front, you're not really seeing how they've altered it. This vest is a good example of that from the front. It looks like any other standard vest, 
but from the side and the back, you can see that there's a little bit of fabric added under the armpit to expand it just an inch or so. And in the back, it's had a little bit of expansion right at the center there. So again, increasing the width of the vest, but without creating uh, any sort of look of being increased from the front. Fabrics definitely have a life cycle as do um, pieces of clothing. So you're going to patch and mend and maintain your clothing for as long as you can. But at a certain point, it becomes something that you just can't feasibly do anymore. The fabric is too weak. It's been patched and mended too many times. So at that point, you look at ways to take that garment and turn it into something else. So you might take a gown, for instance, and cut the skirt out. The skirt generally is a large piece of fabric that doesn't have a lot of wear to it. So you can take that amount of fabric and turn it into something else like a child's garment. Or you might take pieces that are in relatively decent shape and turn them into patches for a quilt. You might put them into a scrap bag that you can then draw from when you are repairing some of your garments. Or you might do, as the maker of this pocket did, and just take some of those little scraps and piece them all together willy-nilly to make a little pocket. After the scraps have gone through the whole life cycle and they're really too far gone to use them anymore, you find women collecting them into bags, particularly cotton and linen, and then selling them on uh, for credit. So those scraps of cotton and linen could then go to the paper manufacturers and paper was being made out of those scraps. So really from inception and creation of the garment all the way through to the very end of the life cycle, where that fabric is being turned ultimately into paper, you have multiple steps where you can economize and make your garments last as long as possible. Folks in the 19th century weren't only maintaining their clothing by mending and patching and darning, but they were also altering their clothing in terms of fit and in terms of fashion. A lot of clothing that was designed to be passed down from one generation to the next, especially children's clothing, had built-in ways to alter it to fit a different body. A lot of drawstring closures at the neck and the waist, growth tucks in the hem that could be either let out to expand the hem or taken back up to shorten the garment, or even just uh, large cuffs that could be let out or taken in depending on who was wearing it. It wasn't only children's garments that were designed or altered to fit the form of a new body. Sometimes adult clothing was also changed and altered as the wearer may have changed shape over time. Or uh, in terms of this dress, probably changed shape but also wanted to adjust the fit in other ways. This dress was made in 1830 originally uh, for a lady named Hope Marino Potter. She wore it originally as her wedding dress but as was common in the early 19th century, your wedding dress was also your nicest dress, so you'd be wearing it many times after your wedding. And as she grew, uh, she perhaps decided that she wanted to alter the neckline a little bit. It was probably originally a fairly off-the-shoulder dress. And she has added a little bit of stitching in the center bodice and a little bit at the sleeve. And all that does is take the neckline up just a little bit and perhaps make it uh, a little bit more modest for a more mature lady. She also expanded it a little bit very cleverly. The original dress had beautiful scalloped cuffs on those long sleeves and she took one of those scalloped cuffs and took it off and added it to the back of her dress. And what that does is it expands the back of the dress bodice by about three to four inches. She's added a few extra hooks and eyes to try and close that gap a little bit. And from the front you would never know that it has been altered. She also took the waistband out which had originally been gathered all the way around and made some larger pleats in the front and that gives you a little bit of extra uh, room in the skirt to accommodate that extra width in the back that she has added. So she changed the fit a little bit for fashion, a little bit for uh, her form, but in other cases you might find folks altering a dress just for the sake of keeping up with the latest fashions. So in the 1830s one of the most common ways that you could do this was by changing some of the sleeves the sleeve in the early 1830s had a lot of fullness right at the shoulder and as the 1830s progressed you have that fullness moving slowly down until it's located by your elbow and by the 1840s the sleeve is much straighter and much more tailored. 
So you can imagine if you have a gown that had that 1830 sleeve with the big fullness right at the top and it's getting a little bit out of date and old fashioned, it would be very easy to tack the top of that sleeve down. In this case, this sleeve just has a little bit of gathering to create that slimmer look up by your shoulder and that naturally moves the fullness and that puff down to your elbow. So you don't even need to take the entire sleeve out and redo it, although that's certainly possible. In this case, all you would need to do is just add a few lines of gathering. You could also disguise other elements of the dress that might be a little bit old fashioned, such as a higher waistline. In the 1830s, the waistline is slowly moving down towards your natural waist. And if you happen to have a waistband that's a little wide and a little bit high, you could disguise that by uh, using a nice belt or creating a beautiful collar or something that can take the sort of uh, focus away from that older fashion and kind of create uh, a newer style that's more in keeping with the later 1830s. So all of these would be things that women are considering and actively doing rather than if your dress gets a little bit out of date, tossing the dress and buying a material to make an entirely new one. And it really is a, quite a clever way to make just a few alterations or add a few decorative accessories to update your dress. And you find ladies are doing this not only with their dresses, but with other accessories like their bonnets as well. So just as dresses are remade and refashioned and reused, you'll often find that bonnets are also another thing that tends to get changed and moved and switched around a little bit. So all of the ones that we have here are part of our collection and they have a glorious amount of variety to them. So you'll notice we have some that have gone for a very elegant kind of soft look, nothing too extravagant. We have another one here who has everything that you can possibly think of on it from feathers to silk flowers to ribbons and more fabric and flowers on the other side to ones that are maybe slightly monochromatic going more for an elegant look in the straw bonnet here with the the fabric along the rim and then of course the decoration on the top and then this silk bonnet is one that I think is very typical for a style of silk bonnet is you have a lot of different silk flowers covering up the crease that happens from the crown and the brim and then everything else is kind of hidden underneath those flowers. Um, it also has, in many cases, some of these have skirts on the back of them. So something like the one that's over here has a little bit of a piece of fabric just to keep the back of your neck a little bit more shaded so that you don't get a sunburn back there. But bonnets in the 1830s are very fashionable and they're very accepted. It's something that if you were going outside of your house, you're usually wearing a bonnet, usually have some form of cap or other headgear on underneath it. And people really like to be individual. So just like today, you're finding the things that are slightly fashionable, maybe picking out the colors that everyone wants and then decorating it to your liking, um, which is why these are probably some of my favorite things that we have in collections because they are extremely individual and people can, can kind of show off their personalities and what bonnets they're wearing. And that is one of the main reasons that all of the things that you see on these bonnets don't tend to be put on with you know, super glue or anything like that, they want them to come off. They are going to use very large stitches. So some of these are even just pinned on. You might not have to actually sew your, your um, flowers and ribbons onto your bonnet. In the case of the, the nice green one that we have here, she's taken massive stitches and she's used them almost like safety pins. So those basting stitches that we have on here are just holding everything in place so that when she's ready to finish, finish the bonnet and sew it together, she has something that's holding everything in. Um, but that being said, if she's gonna cover it with something else, she might even leave those stitches in. So for example, this one has a ton of those really large stitches because she knows that this fabric probably isn't gonna be as durable as some of the other fabrics. So she'll take this, stitch it on with the purpose of knowing she'll probably have to change it at some point in the future. Um, and the great thing about silk bonnets is silk bonnets are extremely changeable. And that doesn't just include the decorations on the outside, it could include, include what fabric you have here. So if I wanted a different color silk, or maybe I wanted to go with a winter bonnet, maybe throw a velvet on there instead, I can take all of the fabric off of this because underneath this layer of silk is a layer of buckram. And buckram is a very stiff fabric that you often use in bonnets like this one. And then to really include more stiffness, they add a whole layer of wire ribbon around the base of the brim, around the top and the bottom of the crown and that will allow for a little bit more flexibility. So if 
I happen to bump it against a door, which I'm sure never happens, or maybe I've, you know, hit it a little bit and it's crunched, I can take that wire and remove it and no one's gonna even know that I've done anything to it. Um, but I can also take this apart completely, take the brim off, take the crown completely away from the brim and cut it down. And that cutting it down is gonna change the shape of your brim. So just like the big bonnet that we have here, it has a very distinct kind of corner to it between the, the brim and the crown. It's now starting to become more fashionable later on in the 1830s to have something that's slightly flatter, that doesn't have as much of that angle. So what you'll find ladies doing is taking their hats to someone called a milliner, who is a hat maker. She will take it apart, she'll trim down your brim so that's a little bit shorter. She'll also make the angle between the crown and the brim just a little bit less, and then she'll cover it with a brand new fabric for you. And if you were someone walking down the street with a brand new bonnet, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a brand new bonnet and the one that's just been remade because they've completely had things changed around. Well, we hope you enjoyed this brief view into our textile collection here at Old Storage Village. Um, and next time you come to the museum, hopefully you can take a look at some of the objects that we actually have out on display and can learn more about the past through the actual objects themselves.